Where do we begin? The Chic Flexamati. The Sonny and Cher Comedy Hour. The Old Housewives Bulge. The Seven. For the Cinderella story, for the 750 and Ryder. One of the most beautiful machines. What a magnificent scrap these two are putting on for the crown. Every time I put my hands on this motorcycle, I am aware of the privilege and burden of owning a piece of history. 750 Super Sport is just one of the most sexy, iconic bikes. The Ducati 750 SS is a 70s benchmark. Some people say it is the most iconic bike of the 1970s. I didn't know what it was back then, but I always knew that these were going to be special bikes. Everyone is drawn so much to this one motorcycle. It's become a mystical thing, basically. <laughs> it's so beautifully made. It has everything that's right about it. It's color, it's noise, it's shape, it's Italian. And the sound. The sound and the sound. The sound is magical. It was the most beautiful sound coming out of a motorcycle I had ever heard. Inside of the motor is music. It was an engine from a different era. That's the Desmodronic. Desmodronic. Desmodronic valves. Just wants to go faster and faster and faster. And when you hit 6,000, 7,000 RPMs, game over. Yeah, they're an artifact, aren't they? There's still nothing like it. And it is the icon of Ducati. It would not be an understatement to say that Ducati, as we know them today, wouldn't exist without that bike. It is a race bike in street trim get that thing up to about 130 miles an hour and it's in a sweet spot. Beautiful, fast, great handling. Wow. If you own one, you know. If you've never ridden one, it's like you've never ridden a motorcycle when you ride. I don't know of any others like this actually anywhere. There is a story for every motorcycle and Keith's is unique. Would you die for your bike, Keith? Would I die for my bike? Oh. I would take a beat down. <laughs> Five five four four because there's no thrill like discovery. motorcycle is considered the best looking bike in the world. Our number three wonder of motorcycles is the 1974 Ducati 750 SS. A wonder of beauty. When you think of the most beautiful car, you think of a Ferrari. When you think of the most beautiful bike, you think of Ducati. This Italian-made limited edition 750 SS is called the Holy Grail of Ducati Dump. With its long, flowing lines and soft green coloring, the 750 has often been compared to a gorgeous woman. It has sort of a, a very flowing, voluptuous shape. It's sort of, you know, tight in the waist and then flows out. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's a very sensual-looking motorcycle. In 1974, Ducati made 400 street models of the 750 SS. Today, only half as many exist. San Francisco artist Keith Hale was lucky enough to buy one in 1975. He says it was love at first sight. When I first set eyes on the Ducati 750 Super Sport, I was just overwhelmed. I wanted it because it was beautiful, it sounded great, and it looked like it would go like hell. And I still feel that way. <laughs> uh, well, my name's uh, Keith Hale. And uh, I was born in 1952 in Oakland, California. We moved down to Kern County for a little while, and I do remember living in Bakersfield, and then we lived in a trailer court in Whaledale, San Leandro, San Lorenzo, Fremont, uh, Hayward, Livermore, and then uh, for a while I lived, in, I lived several years in Berkeley. My family moved around a lot. 
Money was always tight, so we always had old stuff. You know? Dad got me a job at the new factory that he opened up. After I started working in the factory, I bought a Norton, and I wrecked it really quickly. Broke my leg, uh, totaled the bike. So when I got out of my cast, I'd gone back to the Norton shop in San Jose, where it, and, and I found a, uh, the owner was revving up a 1974 Ducati 750 Super Sport. And I was like, I want one of those. And he told me, uh, you'll never find one. They're, they're, they only sent a few of them to this country. And I just kept thinking about it, thinking about it. So I started going there like once a week. Hey man, you really should sell me that bike. You know? Oh man, if, that bike's a race bike. If you sell it to me, I'll race it. And finally, after a couple of months of badgering him, he sold it to me. I wore him down. I wore him down. How much did you pay for that? 3600 which was like $400 over the Ducati's retail. But after I'd gone there begging the guy to sell it to me for all that time, there's just no way I could, could say anything but yes, you know? Yeah. You know, I can understand how he could not help himself but buy it. I was in exactly the same position myself in 1978. These motorcycles are glorious. If you've got the bug, you can't help it. And it, it lasts forever. 750 Super Sport, it's an interesting motorcycle in that I would always use it as the pinnacle of perfection. It has everything that you want and then some. It's a purpose-built race bike, but built for the street. It's loud. It's absolutely beautiful and it does have this uh, certain quality to it that is like no other. And what was it about the bike like when you first saw it? Um, just beauty um, and the sound. It was the most beautiful motor sound coming out of a motorcycle I had ever heard. And I still feel that way. <laughs> the sound is magical. It's a, it's a beautiful mechanical staccato of, of, of lovely noise. Inside of the motor is uh, music. And when you hit 6,000, 7,000 RPMs, game over. There's a massive emotional component as well when you actually hear the thing start. There's something about the sound of the engine, which is a combination of the exhaust pulses from, from the 90 degree twin um, and you know, the, the firing order, as much as the mechanical sound from the, uh, from the valves themselves. So it's uh, a visceral emotion when you, when you hear the engine run, for sure. First five or six years I had that bike, every time I'd pull into a gas station, even though I saw a Ducati in large letters on the gas tank, they go, what is that? <laughs> you know, every time, it's a Ducati. I went from having to explain to everybody what the hell it was, you know, to pulling up and, you know, at, at motorcycle events and whatnot and getting a crowd every time. And that's fun, you know, I've enjoyed that. You didn't know what it was back then. It was the appeal of the bike and the sound, but you actually didn't really know what they were. They built one batch of them, 401, and people have realised that this was the only round case limited production desmodromic model. So it was a unique thing. It, it's become a, a mis mystical thing, basically. <laughs> this is a sexy motorcycle. Everyone that sees this motorcycle has a reaction to it, and they don't even know why. As soon as I saw that fairing, I go, that looks old, but... Before I even got over the top of the hill, I saw this bike and went, holy shit, that's a beautiful Ducati. <laughs> Not even into bikes, but I'm like, that looks special. They're sort of just pulled towards it for some 
reason or another. The oddity of the colors, the, the, the fairing, there's something like deceptively simple and sexy about it. I don't even know, to be honest with you. I mean, like, I, I don't know why everyone is drawn so much to this one motorcycle. Yes, it's rare, but if you don't know what it is, it's just another bike. That's what you would think. And it, it has like that appeal that you can't put your finger on. It's sort of the undefinable. I, I loved it for what it was. I didn't buy it to collect it. I, I wasn't thinking about the future at all. I knew I wanted to race it. 750 Supersport is a race bike built for the street. You could buy the motorcycle and go onto the racetrack and go 120 miles an hour, 130 miles an hour, and be competitive. I wasn't very fast. My first race, I finished second to last. There was one time at Laguna Seca where there was a national event somewhere else, so all the fast guys went to that. And there was only six people in the twins class. And I finished third. Still middle of the pack, but it's third place. You know? <laughs> On a podium. I, I thought it was fun. I mean, just go fast. Yeah, you get that thing up to about 130 miles an hour, and it's in a sweet spot. You know? It just pumps. Yeah, the 750 GT, it's a fantastic motorcycle. 750 Sport, fantastic motorcycle. But when you hit six or 7,000 RPMs and the motor just wakes up again, that's the difference. That's the Desmodronic valve train system. It just wants to go faster and faster and faster and just make more and more power. So Desmodronic valves, the most simple explanation is that they are mechanically closed rather than uh, a valve spring closing them. In the old days, valve springs were not made out of particularly good metal. So when you got up to high RPM, the valves would float. It's allowing it to have a higher red line, which, which allows you to generate more power, but it also makes the combustion itself more efficient, which gives you more power. At some point, I started realizing nobody rides these things. Everybody's got them stashed away somewhere. And then I decided I wanted to take longer trips. I wanted to go to Yosemite, which I, I usually go to Yosemite every summer. I had a set of two under one pipes made so that I'd have space on the back and bought some bagments. Yeah, that's uh, one of my trips to Yosemite. I had my tent and sleeping bag and the whole bit. This was actually right before Tioga Pass, up on Tioga Road. Before I even got to the pass itself, it started snowing. That was a fun trip. I had a good time with that. I went up to Mono Lake, up to uh, Tahoe. At one point, I made the trip back 216 miles, and I did it in two hours and 10 minutes. Finally, by 89, 1990, the speedometer was showing 71,000 kilometers, um, and it quit working. So I got a bicycle speedometer, and then that eventually broke, and I went without for a while. So to be honest, I don't really know how many miles I've got on it. I'm not really sure, but it's got to be over 100,000 miles. What's fascinating about Keith's bike is that uh, because he's taken such good care of it, it has so many miles that he doesn't even know how many miles are actually on it, which is unbelievable. And the fact that it runs to the level that it does is um, a testament to the excellence of uh, Ducati's engineering and a testament to um, mechanics. A mechanic is to maintain. And Keith is the greatest mechanic because he maintained his machine for 47 years, and it starts up on the first kick. I don't know, I just felt like that's what you're supposed to do. I didn't feel that special. There's a lot better mechanics than I am out there. Um, it's kind of like the fox and the hedgehog. You know, a good mechanic is a fox, and knows a lot of different things, right? I, I'm the hedgehog, I know my bike. You know, I, I, know the, I know the hedge. I was raised to believe that that's a good quality, is to be self-sufficient. When something breaks, you fix it, you know? You don't pass it off, you fix it. And then you understand that thing too, right? It's only today do we consider, you know, a car with 100,000 miles on it, high mileage. We never used to. You know, a car built in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, that was 
no mileage at all. Remember Mercedes and Volvo used to have certificates for people who would do a million miles. Irvin Gordon bought this Volvo car in 1966 when he was 25. After 46 years of mutual loyalty, Irvin and his Volvo P1800S are less than 40,000 miles away from reaching 3 million miles. Well, that's pretty common. And so it is with some of these motorcycles. They were built that way. You know, as I put the miles on it too, I was actually proud of the patina. Yeah, my decals were falling off and the paint was fit more faded on one side than the other and you know, there's oil everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. But I was kind of proud of that. That's my baby, so I take care of it. I, I'm always in touch with what's going on with it. And I enjoy, you know, I enjoy working on it. If I have a space to work on it, when I had my shop all set up, it was, I, nothing better than working on your bike and listening to a baseball game. And, and then when it's all put back together and you polish it all up, you sit back and have a beer and you have the most beautiful bike in the world in front of you. You know, that's, that's pretty killer. So you adjusted the valves every 6,000 miles? Uh, more often than that, I mean, I would check it every 1,000 miles. Oh, really? Yeah. I would change my oil and check my valves. But once I had done it a few times, I started realizing, okay, usually I don't need an adjustment and even it, until about 4,000 miles. But also I could kind of feel on the bike, you get you know, not, I mean, it'd be very subtle, but you feel a little bit of the edge is gone. A little less crisp. Time to, you know, clean the carbs, check the valves. The first valve adjustment after breaking, once the valve seats uh, kind of uh, stabilize, after that first valve adjustment, they tend to be very, very stable. Once you set up one of those engines, if you do it by the book, they'll go on forever. The, the engine was so expensive to produce because it was a tower of bevel gears and it took two days to assemble. They're simple and complex at the same time. I mean, it's a bit like a Swiss mechanical watch, I guess. When people make the uh, analogy, oh, it's like a Swiss watch, you know, most motorcycles are not like Swiss watches. They're kind of like, you know, uh, hacksaws and, and chainsaws, you know, that bike is a Swiss watch. It's a, it's a thing of beauty. God, when everything's working right, it's a, kind of a zen. There were times, especially when I was doing like Redwood Road five days a week, you know, there were parts where, where I didn't even feel like I was thinking. And I, and I knew I was going fast and it felt easy. It just, whew, you know, you get to down the road and realize like, man, I haven't had like a real thought in my head for 20 minutes, you know. It's, it's just a great feeling. There's no feeling that's comparable to having a bike running correctly in harmony. It's something that, uh, like, so unto itself. It, it's a gift. That kind of bike, it's very easy to become at one with the bike. Uh, and that's a fantastic feeling. I, I, I don't know of any new bikes today that will give you that connection. It's so beautifully made. When you pull the barrels off and you see that the rods are polished, you know, it's just like, that's cool, man. That's nice stuff, you know. The crank is polished. The rocker arms are polished. They, they really went above and beyond to make this not just a normal motorcycle. They wanted to give you that exceptional flair that brought them to victory at, at Emola in 1972. And the whole, and even the, just the aesthetics of the design, that kind of whole world craftsmanship, just really speaks to me, you know, as, as both a motorcyclist and a mechanic and an artist. I love the Hudson Valley River School of, of painting. And one of the things that I've learned studying them is the way that they would exaggerate atmosphere in a way of trying to communicate the sublime. There's a long discussion, uh, you know, dating back to, to Roman philosophers about what the sublime is. Basically, Kant said that the 
sublime that it combines not just beauty, but mortality, yeah. right? It combines danger. How does that relate to motorcycles? Ha! Huh. Um, doing something that, that has the inherent risk of, uh, say, racing a motorcycle uh, makes one uh, consider your, your mortality. There are certainly moments when I've been riding that I would consider sublime in, in the full sense of the word, you know, not, not just as a trivial adjective, but transcendent, right? Does that, does that make any sense? After the second year of racing the 750, I realized I was spending a lot of money and I'd always told myself I can't afford to go to college. I can't afford to go to college. And I thought, I could have gone to college with that kind of money and I'm not ever going to be an AMA guy, you know. And it's like, well, I'm probably never going to own a home, but I got a cool motorcycle, so I'm just going to study art. And I ended up at the San Francisco Art Institute. I started looking for a teaching gig and I really enjoyed that. I loved my students. Um, it was really fulfilling in a lot of ways, but the pay was crap and no benefits. I was going broke, especially trying to keep, you know, once you're over 50, your health insurance is crazy. I used to joke a long time ago about how once the value of the bike started going up, you know, when they got up to like $30,000 or so, I thought, God, that's crazy. So I started joking that that was my retirement plan. But I think still at that time, I still figured out, I'm gonna go to my grave with that bike. And of course, when I'd show up at the track or whatever, people would go, what are you doing riding that, you know? It's like, well, it's my bike, man. At some point I realized, you know, maybe this really is my retirement plan. So I, I put the word out there kind of half-heartedly, and I told myself at the time, it's like, man, you can't be sentimental about this. This is your retirement, right? I can't imagine what this owner is feeling right now. You know, he needs retirement. I understand all of that. But it must be, in his heart, there must be ache that he has to do what he has to do. In the last 10 years, I lost two friends, two brothers, my mom, um, and I've start to realize how all these things, you know, the objects have these stories behind them. And when people quit telling the stories, the meaning disappears behind those things. And they're just objects again. There is a, a, a story for every motorcycle and Keith's is unique um, and it should be celebrated. And people should care about him, his work, his life, his bike and the person that continues the ownership, you know, they, they, they too should add their life story to it. They should continue the story of the bike. He's looked after the bike all his life. He's never been a wealthy guy. So now the bike has got to look after him. It's, it's quite a good take on the story. It's the end of my story, but I'm passing the baton. And that's important to me, um, you know, as an artist, and just as a person, uh, I storytelling's important. You know, that's that's how we, we make meaning. It's not just another 750 Super Sport. They only built 400, and one of them, many were raised, crashed. Some of them are mismatched. And the problem now is that there aren't that many left either. I mean, the real 750s are what, 200,000? Yeah, there are only a few of those bikes available anyway. Right. And now they've moved into the realm of the, the collector. Its upsurge in market value is um, astonishing. And how do you differentiate your 750 SS from your neighbor's 750 SS? Heaven forbid there should be two in one neighborhood. The only way to do that is with the story. So Keith's bike is, is, is a fascinating um, motorcycle in that. We know that the only person that's owned it is Keith. He's put all of the miles on it. I don't know of any others like this actually anywhere. And it would be a great museum ex exhibit. 
let me reinforce this a little bit by saying the Art of the Motorcycle Museum exhibit, that was the Guggenheim single most successful exhibit, bar none. Prior to that, post that. They've never had such a successful exhibit. Motorcycles in an art museum? Come on, what's going on? But that illustrates how important these bikes are. The term uh, or word perfect was invented by someone who wanted to sell something. Um, nothing's perfect, thankfully. Thankfully, nothing is perfect. The only thing that gives things value is the story that is around them. And it, it's, it, it's not ending the story, right? It's, it's just ending a chapter. I feel incredibly lucky, you know? There was no reason he had to sell me that bike, and there was no reason that when I was 22 years old I had any business having one of those bikes. You know, and I'm not the best rider in the world, you know, or the best mechanic, or, but so in some ways I lucked into that bike, you know? But I appreciated it, I loved it, so I think I've earned that bike, you know? Competition is settled. The drama is over. Everything that happened on the track will fade into the record book. But more will remain than facts and figures. The story of a people who make motorcycling the unique sport it is. Every lap they complete is a tribute to their adventurous spirit. Every flag they take is a testament to their immortality. They are a proud people, traveling faster than the speed of life. From what you've seen, you can tell they are a dedicated people. Their racing is an expression of a kind of joy. But it's much more than fun and games out there. Motorcycle racing is a way of life. Yeah, 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 yeah.